Um, thanks to AAAS for inviting me here. Uh, it's a little daunting for me to talk to you. I have no formal scientific training. For that matter, I have no formal diplomatic training, and yet I am something of a practitioner of science diplomacy, what, whatever that really means. Uh, what I have for you today is a kind of, it's a short presentation, it's a case study that raises a question that should be of interest to both scientists and policymakers, and that is, what do governments, nations, what do nations do, or what ought they to do in the absence of good data, and the absence of adequate science? It has to do with fisheries that don't yet exist in a part of the world's ocean, namely in the center of the Arctic Ocean. Um, I can do this, right? So we start with Mary Shelley. What's she doing here? Well, her novel Frankenstein begins and ends in the Arctic Ocean. Those of you who remember it from high school. Uh, the, ma the first character we meet in the novel, Robert Walton, he is a scientist. He's an explorer. He's charting areas of the Arctic that few humans had been to at that point. Uh, he's trying to push the bounds of human knowledge. And while he is up there, stuck in the ice, he comes upon another scientist who is up in the Arctic for a different reason. This would be Victor Frankenstein, who is, um, has been pursuing uh, the monster that he created, who knows um, a little bit about experiments gone wrong. Uh, and what does this have to do with Arctic fisheries? Well, it has to do with um, Victor Frankenstein and uh, what happened to him in the absence of adequate scientific information. Uh, he uh, comes aboard Robert Walton's vessel and tells the tale that unfolds over the rest of the novel uh, about the experiment gone wrong. And you might say Victor Frankenstein was an early advocate of what we might now call the precautionary approach. That's what we'll be talking about now. So here we have yet another map of the Arctic, uh, similar to ones you've seen before. This is the 200-mile uh, line. Uh, there are also two other pockets down here. The areas in the middle are, at least for the water column, the uh, high seas. They are beyond the jurisdiction of whoops, uh, any of the coastal states, which in this case, Russia, Norway, Denmark, we have in Greenland, Canada, and the United States. The United States had an experience with a different high seas pocket that I want to talk about for just a minute. This is the Bering Sea, and here is the 200-mile line that um, shows the limits of U.S. jurisdiction with respect to fisheries and that of Russia. This area here, high seas, um, there had not been any commercial fisheries in that area of any significance until the mid-1980s. But then, starting in the mid-1980s, a uh, fairly significant fleet of vessels from Japan, China, South Korea, and Poland started fishing using midwater trawls for Pollock in a, a new type of fishery just had developed in a way that really caused the United States and then the former Soviet Union to worry greatly about uh, the stock because the stock they were fishing for was a classic straddling stock. It straddled the 200-mile line that separated the U.S. EEZ from this high seas pocket and also the Russian EEZ from this high seas pocket. And in fact, the fishery collapsed. And to this day, there is no pollock fishing taking place here because there ain't no fish. It was overfished, it collapsed, and that was the end of the fishery <coughs> since then. Now, the Arctic um, is not actually a single region when it comes to fisheries, the part of the Arctic that borders the North Atlantic, up in this region, is, represents the very end of the Gulf Stream that comes through here. And there are very significant commercial fisheries underway here, including up here in the Barents Sea, part of the Arctic Ocean or adjacent to the Arctic Ocean. And the countries in this area have developed a number of 
international agreements to manage fisheries in the area, one of which is the Northeast Atlantic Fishery Commission that manages the fisheries in these high seas areas, including one way up here, it's not even on this map. Uh, Russia and Norway also maintain a fisheries commission um, dealing with fisheries in that area. On the flip side of the Arctic, close to the United States, here we have Alaska, right, and far east of Russia. There is virtually no fishing of a commercial nature north of the Bering Strait. Very limited subsistence fisheries. And there's no international mechanism for managing fisheries there. Here you have those same three high seas pockets in the middle of the Arctic, and there's simply no fishing at all going on here. It has been ice covered year round for all of human history until now. So if you know anything about the Arctic, you'll know it's melting, right? This is the uh, a graph showing the extent of uh, sea ice, uh, minimum sea ice, typically it's always in September. And you can see what the trajectory is. Here's a depiction of uh, what the sea ice extent looked like in September 1984 compared to 2012. Really quite amazing, I think you will, you will agree. And um, some of the area, including some of the high seas area that was not capable of being fished before, is at least potentially able to be fished now. The, how did the United States respond to this? Well, we have part of our 200 mile zone, part of our exclusive economic zone north of Alaska. That's the 200 mile line right there. We took a very interesting decision back about five years, six years ago. We prohibited commercial fisheries in this area. We prohibited commercial fisheries in this area. Why? We didn't have enough science. We did not know enough about the ecology, about the ecosystems of this area, in order to manage any commercial fisheries that might start up there properly. And so we took a decision written into laws, the first ever U.S. Arctic Fisheries Management Plan signed into law by the former Secretary of Commerce, uh, essentially preventing com commercial fishing in this area until there is enough science. The problem is that our jurisdiction ends at the 200 mile line and there is at least the prospect that vessels from any nation could fish just beyond the 200 mile line. And this chart developed by colleagues at Pew shows some areas in this part of the Arctic Ocean that are both ice free for a certain part of the year and at so-called fishable depths. Now, scientists are saying there are no fish yet worth catching there, but the ecosystems are changing, the waters are warming, um, and it is at least reasonable to expect, and there's indeed some evidence this is happening, that fish from more southerly areas are migrating northward such that this area could sustain a commercial fishery sometime soon. What we are trying to do is develop the idea for this area that we developed for this area. Namely, there ought to be no commercial fishing until there is enough science. And I would say in this case, until there is enough science and, an, and some kind of international mechanism for managing fishing in that area. Congress actually recognized this problem as far back as 2008. They passed a joint resolution signed into law by President George W. Bush that called on me, <laughs> called on the Department of State and uh, other agencies to begin the international uh, negotiations to try to take our approach and apply it to the high seas pocket in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Um, and scientists chimed in. Uh, some 2,000 scientists signed an open letter um, a few years ago, and they basically agreed now is the time for the international community to create a precautionary management system for the Central, Ar for Central Arctic fisheries. Such a sh system should postpone fishing activity until such time as the biology and ecology of the region are understood sufficiently well to allow for setting scientifically sound catch levels. We started 
by talking to the four other countries whose exclusive economic zones border this high seas pocket, Russia, Canada, Norway, and Denmark. And as of about a year ago, we essentially came to agreement in principle that we would not allow our vessels to fish in this area until these conditions were met. Here we have the flags of the five coastal states. We met uh, most recently as a group in Nuke, Greenland. That's me. Um, and we are trying to formalize that understanding in the nature of a kind of declaration. But the point is, none of us have jurisdiction except over our own vessels in this high seas area. And so if we are going to be effective, we are going to need to find a way to bring other countries whose vessels might want to fish in this area maybe soon to the table. And we are thinking particularly of uh, three large Asian states that have large fishing fleets that operate far from home, Japan, China, South Korea, as well as the EU and Iceland, another coastal state of the Arctic region. So that's where we are now. We're trying to foment a negotiation of an agreement that would prevent high seas fishing in this area until there is enough science. Thank you.